Hey, 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 it's Dr. J, and today we begin the study of anti-differentiation, which will be one of the culminating processes um, and topics uh, covered in this course. Um, and so in mathematics, when we create a process, such as the derivative process of differentiation, And I'll put that in quotes here because there are many different procedures depending on uh, the function that we have. We start with a function and it produces a new function called the derivative. Right? And so a basic question that we have in mathematics and I guess in life generally is if you can create a process to do something, can you undo it? Can you go the other way? And so we would call that anti-differentiation. In general, what we're asking is if we started with a function, is there a function say capital F where the derivative of capital F takes you back to lowercase f. So this would be the reverse process of differentiation, which we will refer to as anti-differentiation. And the answer is yes, there is. Capital F of X is called an antiderivative of F if capital F prime is equal to lowercase f. We call that the antiderivative. There are several different notations for this. Um, we have the prime notation, and then we'll also have the dy, dx notation. Let's start with the prime notation. Let's start with a very specific function. Uh, determine if capital F of X, let's do 4X to the third, is an antiderivative of little f of X, lowercase, uh, X to the second. So just yes or no, is it, a, is capital F an antiderivative of lowercase f? So again, the abstract would be you're starting with lowercase f and you're going backwards to capital F. And then how do you know that if capital F prime is equal to lowercase f, then the answer is yes. So this is how we're going to check whether or not capital F is an antiderivative. So let's see. F of x is 4x to the third. So f prime of x is 12x to the second. This does not equal lowercase f. It's close, but not exactly. So the answer is no. Capital F is not 
an antiderivative. There is an antiderivative out there. This just is not it. Let's try another one. Same question, different function. Is x to the sixth an antiderivative of 6x to the fifth? So again, start with capital F. Take its derivative. If you get little f, then the answer is yes. Now, again, I'm just sort of breaking the ice here with the concept of how to check whether or not an antiderivative is the appropriate one. Um, the general procedure will be much more um, specific so that you don't necessarily have to check every time. Although it's not a bad idea to check once in a while to make sure that you've done the process correctly. Uh, let's get into some of the um, more exotic examples. Um, the first two, you probably could have just determined it mentally by looking at it and going, no, that doesn't look like the correct um, antiderivative. Is this function an antiderivative of this function? Not something you would be able to typically guess, right? I mean, you could just guess, yes, sure, you could, but I mean, you got a 50% chance of the answer being no. Um, so let's check, all right? Capital F. Let's take its derivative. All right, remember there's a product here. So the derivative of x is 1 times e to the x plus x times the derivative of e to the x, which is just e to the x. So all of that is just this first term, say PR, product rule. Then we have minus, now we'll take the derivative, oh, and I forgot the plus five, sorry. I, I, I Just in time, so when I copy it down here. Uh, it turns out, you'll see in a second, the plus five doesn't matter had I forgotten it, but let's just keep going here. So I've got uh, the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x, and then the derivative of plus five is zero. So even if I had forgotten the plus five, um, the derivative still would have uh, matched. So I've got e to the x plus x e to the x minus e to the x, again, plus zero, which we can ignore that. And then these e to the x's are gonna cancel, and sure enough, the answer is yes. It is, in fact, equal to lowercase f of x. So this is a more exotic example that we will um, develop some strategies today for finding the antiderivative if you were not already given it.
Um, let's do one more example. Uh, let's do one where we have multiple options, sort of like a multiple choice version of this instead of simply a binary yes or no answer. Um, and before I erase this, I should mention I almost screwed up and forgot to write the five, right? Notice the answer still would have been yes because that was a constant. Uh, even if this was a six, the answer still would have been yes. Even if this was 200, the answer still would have been yes. Because of one of our properties of derivatives, the derivative of a constant is always zero. Even if this constant were different, the answer would still be yes. And even if the constant is non-existent, the answer would still be yes, as long as the rest of the terms uh, coincide. So before I do the next example, I'm kind of leading you down the road. Which of the following are antiderivatives of 27x squared minus 6. And I'll give you multiple options. Okay, so which of these are antiderivatives of this? So you can think of these are all possible capital Fs. Is it six or five? That's five, I guess. Five possible capital Fs. All right, so we're calling all of these functions capital F, right, without actually writing that out. So um, again, if you take the derivative of one of these, we're, we're gonna do all of them, but if you take the derivative and you get this, then the answer is yes. So this will be sort of an abstract process. Um, I'll say, uh, take the derivative d dx, right? But I'm using the old-fashioned d dx notation, um, and so that this arrow is just a, an abstract uh, symbol for I'm going from this function to its derivative. So the derivative of nine x squared is eighteen x. The derivative of negative six x is negative six. The derivative of two is zero, so the answer is no. Yep. That is not equal to lowercase f. Let's try the next one. Take the derivative of nine x cubed, you get 27 x squared. So far, so good. Minus six, the derivative of minus six is zero. So close, but no. All right, still no. All right, how about this one? Take the derivative, 9x cubed, again, 27x squared, good. 
and minus six x the derivative is minus six we got one yes that is a that's an antiderivative and you could probably guess at this point the next two are going to also be yeses the derivative of this one is still 27 x squared minus six and then when you take the derivative of the negative seven it's going to be zero so it's still yes and again the last one 27 x squared minus six so it's still yes now if i was to write this all out formally i would say the derivative of this capital f is not equal to lowercase f so no the you know the derivative of this possible capital f right, f prime is not equal to lowercase f so again no but this is just sort of a you know line by line way of just saying yes or no by just visual we say inspection right as opposed to formal calculation i'm just I'm inspecting it, inspector math, and saying, no, no, yes, yes, yes. So generally, what does this mean? Let's erase the nose. And let's just capture these three yeses here. Generally, any function equal to 9x cubed minus 6x plus c for any constant c, now I can erase those. So notice all of the yeses had this form will be an antiderivative of lowercase f. So there are infinitely many possible antiderivatives. Infinitely many. For every possible constant that you can imagine, which of which there are infinitely many, every single one of them would be an antiderivative of this. And I'm not going to do it again. You could do it by inspection. If you took the derivative of this, it would become this. So I'll just say since capital F prime would be equal to lowercase f. So if you took the derivative of this capital F, it would always give you this particular lowercase f. So we sometimes refer to this as a family of antiderivatives. And they're all related to this particular function. They all produce that same function through differentiation, but they each have a different value of c. I might draw some graphs of that when we get deeper into the subject, but let's let's get some more examples under our belt. So um, the definition and symbol for antiderivative. If capital F prime of X is equal to lowercase f of X, then capital F is called an antiderivative.
of f and this symbol, which is the Greek letter S. It's, well, it's not actually a Greek letter S. It's it's a it's derived from the Greek letter S sigma. It doesn't actually look like the Greek letter S. The Greek letter S looks like this. Uh, you might see it on like, you know, frat row or, you know, sorority house or something or a movie based on those things. If you've never seen one in real life, uh, it's a very common letter used uh, um, in the Greek system. Uh, we call this the Greek letter S sigma. So this is derived from that letter. Um, it's, it's a, a stretch <laughs> of this letter, but I'm not going to go there today. We might get deeper into that today, but we call this a summation. Yeah. It's called the antiderivative. And then we use the DX. That means with respect to X. I will write this all out in a minute is equal to capital F, again, not capital F prime, but just capital F, right? Capital F is the antiderivative plus any constant. So we say the indefinite, here, let me say it over here. We say the indefinite integral that's this symbol here the indefinite integral of F or of F of X with respect to x, so that's the dx, so the indefinite integral is this symbol here. of f of x, I don't know if this is helping or not, but I don't know, I always, I find it useful to know how to read the mathematics. So the indefinite integral of f of x with respect to x is, I don't have to say that, or is equal to, um, capital F of X plus C. Or sometimes we'll say plus a constant. So the indefinite integral of lowercase f of X with respect to X is capital F of X plus a constant. That is the definition and symbolism of the antiderivative. So this gives us a, um, a way of writing it down in a nice clean way that will correspond directly with our previous um, notations and calculations of derivatives that we've explored in the last few chapters. Okay. Let's do an example of that. I hate to erase all of this, but I have to put something down.
So here's an example. Lowercase f is x to the fourth. Capital F is one-fifth x to the fifth. So the indefinite integral of x to the fourth with respect to x is equal to one-fifth x to the fifth plus c. So this is in a specific example of the antiderivative written out as in what's called an indefinite integral. I usually try to stretch out the letter S a little bit so it's more like this. There's lots of different ways to do it. Some people get really fancy with it. I've seen people do these little curly Q things here. Um, if you're a music major, you might have seen these on a violin. It's like a, they call it an F hole, right? You see it on the violin or a, um, a cello or something like that. Um, if you're really lazy, you can just kind of go like that. That's kind of the super lazy version of it. Just practice writing it. You're going to be writing it a lot in this chapter. Um, and there you go. Um, and now I will just put the reason why. I'll put that in a cloud. Why? Because f prime of x is x to the fourth. Yeah, capital F prime of x is f to the fourth. And lowercase f of x is equal to x to the fourth. So capital F prime of x is equal to lowercase f of x. If you took the derivative of one-fifth x to the fifth, the 5 would come down. I know I don't have to write this, but I'll do it anyway. The 5 would come down. You would multiply. So you'd get 5 fifths, right? 5 times 1 fifth would be 5 fifths. Then you would subtract 1. So you'd get 4. And then the 5 fifths would cancel, and you would just get x to the 4th. So check. That's the mental check that you would do to verify that your antiderivative, also known as the indefinite integral, is correct. And now we have entered into the next phase of calculus called integral calculus. So welcome to your new life. All right, um, that's it for that. Um, we're going to do a whole bunch of these moving forward, so I don't need to belabor that one anymore. Um, other notations. Um, if you had the indefinite integral of something that's already written as a derivative. So this is already written as a derivative. So you can think of this as the antiderivative of the derivative just gives you back the same function plus a constant. So an example of that, if f of x is, uh, let's keep it simple. Let's do, um, I don't know, x squared. It's about as simple as it gets for this class. And f prime of x would then be 2x. So the integral of 2x dx all right, that's your f prime, is equal to the original function x squared plus a constant. So in this notation, 
we do not use a capital F. So we just avoid the capital F altogether. We do the entire problem using only lowercase f. It means the same thing, right? So example five and example six are demonstrating the same principle and the same um, concept of anti-differentiation and the, the, the symbol for the uh, integral, indefinite integral, but one of them uses two different versions of the letter F, capital and lowercase, which can be confusing, especially if you're writing F, 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 and, and then you mix up which one's the capital and which one's the lowercase. So I've done that myself. Uh, I mean, be thankful that we're not using a letter like C, right? We're a capital C and a lowercase C, or <laughs> I don't know if we're going to get back to profit at some point. We might, uh, you know, capital P and a lowercase P could look very much alike. At least Fs are one of those letters where the capital and the lowercase are, are different enough that the, the chances of making a mistake are, are slimmer. All right, so those are the notations. Um, next, let's get to the rules because we're going to want to um, reverse all of the rules from the previous chapters. And so instead of having derivative rules, let's have anti-derivative rules. So the antiderivative rules, I would start off just by copying them all down um, and having them handy. You make yourself like a handy dandy you know, list of rules. Uh, refer to them whenever necessary, but at some point you're going to want to memorize them because you're not going to want to have to look these up every time. So rule number one, the antiderivative of a constant now I use two different letters for constants. I use K sometimes, and sometimes I use C. Um, I usually use K when I'm talking about the antiderivative or the indefinite integral, same thing. Um, and then I use C when I'm talking about the result. So that will be KX plus C. That's the constant rule. Uh, you can easily verify these. I'm not going to do all of them, but I'll just mention a couple of them. This one's very easy. If you took the derivative of kx, you would just get k. If you took the derivative of c, you would get zero. So these are very easy to confirm that, that I'm not just making these up. Uh, I'll put a star next to this one. This one's probably what's called this the workhorse. This is the, the bread and butter function. This one does a lot of the, the load lifting. Um, X to a power N is plus one. So instead of, remember the old rule was subtracting one. That was derivative. So this is antiderivative. So we're adding one. And then instead of multiplying, you're going to divide by the new power. You divide by the new power. So whatever the old power was, you add one to it. All right. Simple example, if this old power was two, then the new power would be three, and then you would divide by three. These are very easy to verify. I'll, I'll, I'll do some examples in a minute um, with, with specific numbers. And then don't forget your plus C. Now there is one rule for this. Um, because you can't divide by zero. The n cannot be negative one. So n cannot be negative one. Any other number except negative one. So that means negative one has its own special rule. 
not going to be the same as, as this rule. So if the power is negative 1, that's the same thing as 1 over x. I like to write it both ways. This one becomes the ln of the absolute value of x plus c. This one requires a special um, example, which I will show you soon. For now, I'm just writing down the rules. I should maybe say, to illustrate this, it requires a special example that I'm not giving yet. All right, rule number four. B to the X power. Sometimes I like to do A to the X power, but I'm just, I'm following what, what, what our book uses is B. B stands for base, but I, you could also use A I probably will use A at some point, um, but for now, I'm just writing down the rule. It's B. A couple reasons why I like B. Well, there's one main reason why I like B, uh, because it sounds like base. But there's also a reason why I don't like B, is if you write it too quickly, B tends to look like a 6. If you're writing very sloppy, but anyway. So this rule is very similar to this rule, um, except for you have to remember the logarithm from the derivative rules. Now, for rule number three, you do need the absolute value. And I'll, again, I'm going to have to give you a special example to show why that's true. Um, for rule number four, you do not. All right, so it's just the ln of b with parentheses. I mean, there's a long explanation for why that's true. Uh, the short explanation is in rule number three, x could be any real number. So we need the absolute values to sort of protect the integrity of the logarithm. You, you can't take the logarithm of a negative number. All right, b, however, must be a positive number. So you don't need the absolute values because B is already positive. Um, and then plus C. So those are your first four antiderivative rules. Number two is probably the one we will use the most. After that, probably number one. Number one's very simple. Three and four require special attention. Um, number four comes directly from the derivative rule. So if you if you if you'll go back in chapter two and, and look up the derivative rule, you'll see that if you took the derivative of bx, you would also have this ln of b, and then they would they would cancel out. And so this one kind of makes more sense. I'm going to show you why rule number three in just a minute. Let me finish writing down the remaining rules. We got four more rules, so there's eight rules altogether. Um, sometimes they get compressed into seven rules, but it depends how you like to write it down. I like to write all eight. So the next one, rule number five, is a special case of rule number four. If the base is E, so rule number four, rule number five are the same rule, um, but in the special case that the base is E, that would be E to the X over LN of E, which is E to the X over one, which is just E to the X. So it's a special case of rule number four. Typically, we don't write all of this down. 
and we just write the final result e to the x plus c. I mean, you can certainly write it down once, so you have it in your notes, uh, but generally speaking, we would just go from here to here. Okay, um, what else? Um, so that's it for the specific functions. And then now we have general function rules. Number six, the integral of f of x plus g of x is the integral of f plus the integral of g. It's just like the derivative rule, right? Back in the derivative, if this was the derivative of f plus g, you would say the derivative of f plus the derivative of g. Well, these are antiderivatives, you know, which we call integrals, or in, in particular, indefinite integrals. I don't know which is easier to say, antiderivative or indefinite integral. Um, you can just say integral for short. Some people combine six and seven into one rule because they really are the same rule. Just changing uh, plus to a minus. Well, if the derivative of a, if the integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals, then the integral of a difference is the difference of the integrals. Uh, you might get lazy and stop writing the dx's. Um, I know when I was, you know, in my early 20s and was taking calculus, um, I was probably younger than that, but yeah, I was 19 or 20, um, you know, lazy 19 or 20 year old. And I uh, didn't really want to write f, x, g, x, dx all the time. And you get away with it. I mean, you would get away with this as long as nobody saw you. Um, you would still get the right answer, but um, I, I want to show you the proper form. The dx tells you that you are taking this antiderivative with respect to the variable x. Well, if the problem has no other variable besides x, well, then it's obvious that it's x. But we have seen problems where the variable changes to p or to t or to y or something else. So we have to be careful that we are taking our um, antiderivatives with respect to the proper variable. And then the last rule ties in the first rule with the k, when you have a constant, you can just remove the constant out in front of the integral and then we say ignore the constant, find the integral, and then put the constant back or apply the constant after you've integrated. Okay, so those are your eight rules. Um, I'm gonna show you examples of all of them at some point. Let's start by Explain, let me start by explaining the rule number three. So we'll call this example seven. Oh, give you a minute. You can always pause the screen and write this down. Uh, we're, you're going to see all of this again in a minute. Maybe. Let's go back and explain rule three. Um, so let's just recall what a piecewise function is. So if I said the ln of the absolute value of x... That would be equal to x 
if x is greater than or equal to zero, oh, sorry, ln of x, if x is greater than or equal to zero. So the piecewise function applies to the absolute value part, um, but I'm talking about rule number three, so I'm introducing the logarithm and the absolute value sort of composed together. And then this would be the ln of negative x, or it's actually better to say the opposite of x if x is less than zero. Now you do need to make a special note to yourself we call this negative x, but it's actually a positive number because x itself is less than zero. So it's better to say the opposite of x, or in other words, the opposite of a negative, and the opposite of a negative is actually positive. So both of these arguments are in fact positive. Both of these x's are positive. And that drives my algebra students crazy uh, when, when, when I get questions about this because it, with your eyes, I'll be writing it down quickly. And when I tell you that both of these are positive, you know, if you're new to the game, you, you, you go, well, how could they both be positive? You know, one of them clearly looks negative, but you gotta dig a little deeper and you have to look at the pieces of the function. All right, so let's take um, the derivative of ln of absolute value of x. So that would be the derivative of ln of x. So we'll call this piece one. Piece one will be the top piece. So the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x, right? Review of chapter 2. The derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. If x is greater than or equal to zero. So that's the standard uh, natural logarithm derivative. Now let's do piece two. The derivative of ln of negative x. Well, you remember the rule, one over negative x times negative one. That's the chain rule. Also in chapter two. So this chapter four really could have came immediately after chapter two. Right. We did that little dive into graphing and, and some applications of the derivative, but that really was not necessary to do what we're doing today. In fact, part of me thinks maybe going from chapter two directly to chapter four would make more sense. Um, but, you know, here we are now and, and, and now we're here. So, so that's the chain rule. And so one over negative X times negative one, the negatives are going to cancel and you're just going to get one over x, right. if x is less than zero. So in both cases, or in both pieces, uh, the derivative of ln of x is equal to one over x, right? Therefore, the integral of 1 over x is equal to ln of the absolute value of x plus c.
So I hope that explains it. Um, if, if not, just memorize it. I know when I was new at this, I really wanted to understand, you know, um, it's beneficial for your long-term development to really understand the, the nature of this, but it's also sometimes necessary to simply memorize something, do it over and over and over again, and then sometimes the understanding comes when you least expect it. You'll have what we refer to as an aha moment. You'll be like, ah, oh, I get it now. And sometimes it's just right when you really need to get it. You know, math has a very special way of rewarding you just when you need it. Okay, um, so that's the only rule I'm really going to, uh, you know, uh, elaborate on like that. I think the rest of the rules are pretty common sense. Again, common meaning common sense for a calculus student who is gone through what we're up to week 12 we're, uh, now 12 weeks at the very minimum of um of study and, and practice so let's just do some more examples and, and wrap this lecture up all right maybe maybe we will get out of here before an hour and a half all right example eight um use the rules uh, sometimes i call them the introductory rules because there are gonna be more rules um, of anti-diff, right? Also, also called AKA indefinite integrals. Anti-derivatives, anti-differentiation, indefinite integrals. We love to, um, use lots of different words for the same thing. All right, let's do the simplest one. Uh, rule number one, the, the antiderivative of four with respect to X. Well, that's just four X. And then don't forget plus C. Uh, be careful when you're typing this. Um, Make sure you type a capital C. Now I would mark it right if you type lowercase c, the computer should mark it right, but it might not. Computer is very picky. It, it thinks a capital C and a lowercase c are different symbols because technically they are. Um, I would have to go in there and veto the computer. I will do that if I have to, just reach out to me. But it's better if I don't have to, just type it correct the first time. So, so that's it. Um, and that's the reason why the DX is so important because if the DX wasn't there, then you wouldn't know what variable to use. Right? And if this was a different variable, well, then this would have to be a different variable. So if that was a DT, well, then the variable would have to be T. Right? So the DX part, although it's, you know, you can get away without writing it sometimes, it is very important. It tells you what language you're speaking, right? We're speaking the language of X. Well, since X is the most common variable, you can get away with it sometimes. All right, rule number two. Sometimes call this the power rule. The antiderivative of x to the fifth. So you add one and then you divide by that. Normally we skip this step. This is the mental math step. Well, I'm going to show it one time. Uh, you can also write it as a fraction. If you write it as a fraction, be careful that the X is not below the fraction bar. 
So either make sure the X is on the top of the fraction or next to the fraction. Don't put it down with the denominator. That would get marked incorrect. Okay. Uh, example nine. One over x to the fifth. Well, I would rewrite this as x to the negative five. And then I would use the same rule. Plus one, the power rule. As long as the power is not negative one, then you can use this rule. If you tried to use this rule when the power was negative one and you just forgot that you weren't allowed to, when you get to this step, you'd have dividing by zero and that would be wrong. So that is your final answer for this one. Okay, you can do this part mental math if you like. MM. Mental math. I like to write it down because sometimes people will go plus one and they'll accidentally make it negative six. And I could see why you do that. You know, your brain goes five plus one and you get six. Right? But it's not. It's negative five plus one, which is negative four. Um, or you could write it like this. Negative one over four X to the four plus C. If the power is negative, then you can put the variable down with the denominator. So keep that in mind. Maybe I'll just call that example nine since it took up the whole page. I won't do a part B on that one. All right, we're really cooking now. Um, example 10. The indefinite integral of the square root of x dx. Or the antiderivative of x to the one half. Well, again, as long as the power is not negative one, then you can use the power rule. So it's going to be one half plus one divided by one half plus one and then plus C. Uh, now, you could do this one with mental math, but I'm not going to. I'm going to write it all out. So it's X to the three halves divided by three halves. Then you're gonna flip the three halves and multiply. So you're gonna get two thirds X to the three halves plus C. Or two-thirds times the square root of x cubed plus c. Right? x to the three halves really means the square root of x cubed. Or <laughs> 2 times the square root of x cubed all over 3, and then plus c. So this one has a lot of different forms. I personally would probably just stop here. I mean, you could even stop back here, but it's very ugly with a fraction and another fraction, and it's hard to make you know heads or tails out of it. Um, I guess you could use a decimal, 1.5 instead of three halves. I, I, I'm not going to go there. 
Not unless we're talking about money. I usually don't uh, resort to decimals. Money or time. Yeah. 1.5 seconds. $4.3 or something like that. All right. So that's your first 10 examples. Now we're just going to kind of coast through the rest of them. Um, now uh, let's keep using the rules. So what? how many rules do we have? We've got a lot of rules. Um, like I said, the first couple rules are your bread and butter rules. You use those quite a bit. Uh, let's let's just practice a couple more. E to the x, uh, one over x, and three to the x. These are just straight memorization rules. Right? There's not a lot of work here. You just have to know the rule. So the integral of e to the x is e to the x, and then don't forget the plus c. The integral of 1 over x, that's the same as x to the negative 1. That's that special rule, absolute value, ln, absolute value, and then plus c. You could just jump right to here if you like. I do like to write it as negative one a couple times just to remind everybody that that's the special rule that we talked about. And then, uh, so A and C are related to each other. They're both exponential functions. But because this is a base B, you got to divide by ln of whatever the base is, in this case, three. So I would say example 11 is really just uh, memorization or sometimes we call it recitation, which is reciting something that you just learned and you recite it like a verse over and over again until you, until you get it in your mind. Or you keep a handy dandy, you know, where's my handy dandy notes here? I made one myself just to make sure I don't forget them. Not a bad idea just to have all of your rules written down. All right. Example 12. We talked about square roots quite a bit. Well, not quite a bit in this lecture, but quite a bit in this course, we've done some square roots. We haven't done a lot with cube roots. Well, a little bit, but, or in general, we call these nth roots. Right. So three could be uh, any index, three, four, five, so on and so forth. Remember, a root is a fractional power. So any uh, a square root is probably the most common one, one half, but you could also have cube roots, fourth roots, fifth roots. I'm going to demonstrate a third root or a cube root. You gotta add one, one third plus one. Don't forget your plus C. That's gonna be four thirds when you add one to the power. So the new power is four thirds. Then you're gonna divide by four thirds. Then you're gonna flip. Notice it follows the same pattern as the square root. And I, for this example, will stop here because I'm already going over an hour now. There are several other ways to write this final result. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to do today is... General form. So general forms are functions like f of x and g of x, so it's not specific. Uh, let's just do one. Um, let's do the integral of 6 f prime of x.
Well, that would be six times the integral of f prime of x. Again, general form. So if I'm taking the integral of f prime, I would just get f. The six would then come down in front and then plus c. All right, I guess I'll just do one more. It's a good place to stop um, while I have it out. So let's call that part A. Uh, part B, since I've got a second function G, let's do the integral of F of X, F prime of X plus G prime of X DX. Well, again, general form. I'm not being very specific. I just have these two functions, f and g. I'm taking the integral of the derivative, or you can think of it as the antiderivative of the derivative. So that would just give me uh, the integral of f plus the integral of g. Right. Since these are primes, when I take the integral, I just get back the original f. For this one, I get back the original g. And then I don't forget my plus c. That's about all we have time for today. Um, so in, in, in the sequel to this video, we will expand on the introductory rules and then we'll get deeper into the weeds of um, more exotic, complicated um, functions with lots of different terms and lots of different operations. Um, but um, until we meet again, I'm Dr. Jordan, and I'll see you on the Internet.